Your brain is one of the most amazing organs. It does incredible things, not all of which we're entirely familiar with. Much of it is still a mystery. But as we learn more about it, it's great to discuss that and open up those conversations. So on a regular basis, we look at our brain power. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Gordon. Now, she's um, a researcher and... uh, (laughs) She's got a great link to whistling, which we will find out in just a moment. But she is also one half of the name of a syndrome uh, that was developed through research that she did. Well, she didn't develop the syndrome. It was there. They just discovered it. Dr. Sarah Gordon, good afternoon. Hello, hello. It's good to Uh, talk with you. What's your whistling connection? That was just phenomenal whistling. I grew up in the country and so recognised quite a few of those songs, actually. Oh, good on you. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, um, you use your lips to whistle, but we use our brains to think. And you are in particular someone who loves, uh, has discovered and researches a particular protein. Tell us the name of this protein and why it's important. Uh, It's a a bit of a tricky name. Uh, It's called synaptotagmin. Um, And it's one of the most uh, important proteins uh, in the human brain. Um, So basically, uh, the way that our brain communicates is by sending electrical signals, uh, both within itself and then throughout the body. Uh, So when that electrical signal needs to get passed from one cell to another, uh, it needs to get converted into a chemical message. uh, And that comes in the form of neurotransmitters. So these, this happens at these uh, communication relay points that are called synapses. So synaptotagmin is essentially the sensor that tells the neuron or the brain cell exactly when to release these neurotransmitters. Uh, so it's absolutely uh, essential for our brain to function properly. And when it doesn't work properly, that's when you have problems. And what kind of problems do you have? Well, um, this uh, story really started um, quite a few years ago now. Um, I was having a coffee with my uh, colleague from Cambridge in the UK, uh, Kate Baker, and we were discussing an entirely different project. Uh, but then she told me about Lucas, uh, who presented in her clinic with a really unusual disorder. So he first presented with uh, floppy baby syndrome, and then he went on to develop... Um, developmental delay. So he was slow to learn how to move, how to sit up. Uh, He only learned how to walk at 10 and he still can't speak. So he then went on to develop a movement disorder. So this is uncontrolled movements of his limbs and then these unusual behavioural characteristics. So his mood would switch from calm to highly agitated um, without any obvious cause. Uh, and his brain looked completely normal uh, when we did an MRI. However, when you looked at his electrical brain activity, uh, it was highly unusual. And all of these, this together didn't fit any uh, known disorder. So that's what piqued uh, Kate's interest and my interest in trying to decipher what was happening. Uh, so, so Kate asked me if I knew anything about synaptotagmin. Uh, And in fact, I happen to be working uh, on that protein as well. So Lucas uh, had a mutation in the gene that's encoding synaptotagmin. And in fact, this is the first known case of a person with a mutation in synaptotagmin. Um, So I'm sure everybody knows, um, but the genes are, they're the blueprints to make proteins. So the proteins are like they're like the molecular machines of the body. They're the, they do things, right? Yeah. So mutations in genes happen all the time, uh, and in fact, they're really important for for evolution. Um, so the trick is to know when there's a harmful mutation uh, and when there's a benign mutation. Yes. Yes. So so as a sort of an example, you know, if you're trying to build a car, right? And if your instructions tell you to make it green instead of blue, that's not really a big deal. But if your instructions tell you to put a square wheel on a car, then that's a big problem. And that's unfortunately what happened to Lucas. Um, So basically his synaptotagmin has a square wheel. 
you discovered this along with Kate Baker and this yeah. became known as the Baker-Gordon syndrome. It must yes. be very weird to have it's, a condition named after you. It's a very odd thing, yes. We didn't make that decision. That was not on <laughs> us. Um, uh, we threw around a lot of different names, actually. Um, uh, Lucas syndrome was, was one of those. Um, Lucas isn't the only one with this, um, so we didn't decide, you know, didn't think it was appropriate. But basically it was uh, up to um, the people who run this online database of all these, um, the genetic uh, disorders. Now, and they're the ones that named it after us. So, now, yeah, obviously, very odd. if you have a pattern or a set of instructions, as you described it, to continue yeah. that analogy, if you mm. rub it out and reissue the instructions, hopefully things go well. Can you somehow re um, or, or change the mutation in a gene? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you did genetic editing, for example, um, you could do that, but that's uh, really in its infancy at the moment. Um, and you always run the risk of making something worse. Uh, and this uh, mutation has been present since birth as well. And the brain puts down a lot of wiring. So there's a lot of sort of questions about whether... You know, unless you get to it really early on, if you, if you know, genetic editing would actually help anything at all. So, um, uh, so we're trying to go down a different route. So rather than going down the genetic editing route, we're trying to see if there are any uh, drugs that are available um, that might be able to to help um, with at least some of the symptoms that that these individuals have. Now, calcium plays a role in all of this. Can you explain what that is and and what role that plays? Yeah, so so basically the the way the brain uh, decides how to release neurotransmitters um, is due to this influx of calcium, right? So so calcium floods into your neurons and then that tells synaptotagmin you need to trigger neurotransmitter release right now. So it's super, super fast. We're talking on, you know, microseconds at a scale. Um, so... What this mutation does is essentially slow down the ability of synaptotagmin to either sense the calcium or to relay the message. And that slows down your communication between your brain cells. So so basically that's what's happening in this disorder, mm. that the neurons aren't able to speak to each other um, as quickly as they need to. Um, and so your brain activity is disordered. Now, my understanding is that Baker-Gordon syndrome is pretty rare. Um, yeah. And we're uh, talking about the role calcium plays, but I'm wondering on a broader scale, does it say anything about the role calcium plays in all of our brains? Yeah, it does. I mean, we, we certainly know that, that calcium is absolutely essential for brain function, um, but our brain is really good at controlling the amount of calcium uh, that goes into brain cells, right? So that's the whole the whole um, way that that brain activity is regulated. So it's not like you could just you know take more calcium and that would fix the problem, right? So um, so what we really need to do is sort of trick the, the the neurons into reacting more to the calcium or to uh, let a little bit more calcium in. That's the way that we're trying to. Um, uh, to to go at the moment. So we're trying to uh, test out a range of drugs that should um, increase the amount of calcium that sort of floods in. But you're absolutely right that, that this, is a, this is a really rare disorder. Um, so we started with Lucas. Um, after we, we published that first study, we were then contacted by clinicians all over the world. So you know, the States, Israel, um, uh, everywhere really. Um, about children who had um, a similar neurodevelopmental disorder and they all had mutations in synaptotagmin. So we went on and characterised it and and, um, and I used this disease in a dish model, right? So basically we use these fluorescent reporters and they make uh, neurons in a dish flash when they release neurotransmitters. It's really, you know, quite cool to look at under a microscope. Um, so, so what was interesting is that the uh, the children who had the most severe forms of the disorder, so um, they they harboured mutations that caused the greatest effect on the ability of these brain cells to communicate. And what we think now is that actually there's probably a range of disorders that are similar to Baker-Gordon syndrome that might also 
affect brain activity in a similar way. So although it's this ultra rare disorder, you know, we're talking about, you know, dozens of people worldwide that we're aware of right now. There will be more who have it, but they just haven't been diagnosed yet. Um, but it's still going to be quite rare. Um, but by looking at these other disorders that are related to Baker-Gordon syndrome, we're hoping to, um, to find new possible therapies and also find out more about these other disorders. So maybe these, you know, ultra rare disorders aren't so rare after all. Dr. Sarah Gordon, thank you for your time. Fascinating finding.